Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> you folks had an awesome day yesterday. That was outstanding. When uh, our two youngest daughters, Katie and Emily, were in middle school, they played in the uh, yearly musicals that they had. And one of them, Katie, played in uh, the uh, Builder on the Roof presentation. And the guy that played Tibia is now her husband. <laughs> but the time that she was Golda and he was Tibia, they hate each other's guts. <laughs> they can stand each other. So, we have this very tender and moving scene from the play of Fiddler on the Roof, where Tibia and his wife Golda are being forced to move on to their home in Russia. And one day Tibia comes into the house and he asks his wife Golda, Golda, do you love me? <laughs> do I what? <laughs> do you love me? Golda looks at him and then responds, do I love you? With our daughters getting married and this trouble in a town, you're upset, you're worn out, you go inside, you lie down, maybe it's indigestion. <laughs> Golda sighs and she looks at him and says, do I love you? For 25 years I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given your children, milked the cows. After 25 years, why talk of love right now? Tevi answers by saying, Golda, the first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared, I was shy, I was nervous. So was I, said Golda. But my father and my mother said we'd learned to love each other. And now I'm asking, Golda, do you love me? Do I love you, Golda sighs. For 25 years, I've lived with him, fought with him. 25 years, my bed is his. If that's not love, what is it? Then you love me, Tevi asks. I suppose I do, she says. And I suppose I love you too, he says. It doesn't change a thing. But after 25 years, it's nice to know. Do you love me? Is the same question Jesus is asking Peter in the closing scene of the Gospel of John. So let's begin with Simon out in his boat. He's fishing alongside other disciples. He's brooding. He's thinking deep thoughts, not quite sure what to make of all that's happened. Then there is a flashback. He recalls how several months earlier he left his fishing nets at the seashore to, to follow her, to become a follower of Jesus. And how Jesus liked him and included him and changed his name from Simon to Peter, which means Petros, the rock. Because Jesus felt that Simon was strong and stable and solid like a rock. Then all of a sudden, things turned south. Jesus was arrested. And Peter the rock got scared. And on that fateful night, he denied the Lord three times. The next day is Good Friday. Jesus was nailed to the cross, and Simon Peter was, was devastated, shattered, defeated, and brokenhearted. But then came Easter, and Simon Peter was, was at one and the same time thrilled beyond belief, excited, and gratified over Christ's resurrection, and yet confused and perplexed by his own future. And here yet Peter returns to Galilee with his friends, and sees the apostles, a number of other additional apostles, and return to their, their native Galilee, same thing as Tiberius. With some assuming their, their former occupations. In Matthew and Mark, a critical note is sounded here. Because each mentions the disciples' lack of faith. And records Jesus going to uh, call to go forth into the world. <coughs> go forth into the world. Hold that thought. <laughs> so he's telling them to go forth into the world. And something apparently has, has failed 
And the men's resolve and conviction during this time. And several days have passed, and yet nothing's happening. So Simon Peter and his friends have been waiting in Galilee for something to happen, waiting for some direction from God, but nothing's going on. And finally, in typical fashion, Simon Peter gets impatient. He can't take it anymore. And he says, I'm going fishing. It's kind of like Simon saying, you just can't take this. This waiting around is driving me nuts, driving me up a wall. I'm worn out with indecision. The waiting, the risk involved. I'm going back to the old secure life. The old life of being a fisherman. The others kind of go right along with him. So in our present story, Jesus takes charge of Peter's fishing adventure. Despite the fact that they fished all night, they had no luck. Kind of sound like some of us guys like to go fishing, don't we? Fish all day and all we get is mosquito bites. That's all we catch. Then the dawn breaks. They see someone standing on the shore. They realize it's the risen Lord, but they don't recognize him really at this point. He tells them to cast their nets to the other side of the boat. How do you do it? They bring in a, a huge catch, 153 large fish. And John turns to Peter and he says, It's the Lord. And son Peter, excitable and impulsive, dives in and swims to shore urgently. Now let the other six disciples to come in on the boat. The catch is so big they couldn't pull the nets into the boat, so they Drug alongside the boats. Now they're, they're dragging a boat and this net of, net of uh, fish to shore as they tie the boat up to the dock. But you notice when, when Jesus sees, says to them, bring me fish, Peter hits that boat. He grabs a whole net and drags that whole net ashore by himself. Peter wasn't a man to be trifled with. He's a strong man, you know, strong-bodied man. But he's weak in soul, probably because of the charcoal fire. You know, it's easy to get caught up in a trivial interpretation of Scripture and kind of miss the point at times. If you take a look at John 21, 11, Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153. Be so many, the net was not torn. My question is, now, why in heaven's name did they mention how many fish was in that net? <laughs> why is that important? You know, other people also ask that same question. Cyril of Alexandria, in the 5th century, said that 100 represented the fullness of the Gentiles. The 50 symbolized the remnants of Israel. And the three left, of course, represent the Trinity. And Augustine's theory in the 5th century was a little more complicated. He said, there's ten commandments, and seven's a perfect number of grace. If you add that up, that's 17, right? So now, if you add all the numbers from 1 to 17 together, like 1 plus 2 <coughs> plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, all the way up to 17, you'll get 153. Try it. And not only that, but if you arrange them, with 17 fish in the first row, then 16, then 15, then 14, then 13, all the way down to one, you get a perfect triangle. Figure that one out. Who symbolizes the Trinity again. But Jerome, who also lived in the 5th century, suggested that there were 153 different types of fish in the sea. And it was symbolic of the church reaching people all around the world. Well, here's another theory. They had to divide the fish up somehow. So Peter being the skipper got 21%. That's 32 fish. John being the mate got 16%. That's 25 fish. And all the others got 10%. 10.5% 10 10 really. So that's 16 fish each. Total it up. 153 fish. Not bad thought, is it? You see if you get all tied up and caught up in really trivial stuff and miss the whole point that we need to be obedient to Christ today. So as they come ashore, they see the risen Christ cooking breakfast for them. 
over a charcoal fire. Now, if you recall, there had been another encounter across a charcoal fire in Caiaphas' courtyard when Peter denied Jesus not once, but three times before that cock crow. And now, with the smell of charcoal all around him, he stands with his guilt and shame across that charcoal fire on the beach with Christ. And it was there on the beach. She said, breakfast ready. It'd be the last meal they'd share together here on earth. They didn't know that yet, but it would be the last breakfast. And the significance of this breakfast for Peter was probably the most poignant moment in his ministry and his life. Because that breakfast of grilled fish and bread was laid out across that charcoal fire. How would you enjoy seafood? Oh, yeah. Especially fresh fish. Oh, yeah. I remember as a kid, summer in Michigan, my grandparents, my grandpa was quite a cook. And I can just see him and smell him cooking up fresh bass and bluegill caught the night before with scrambled eggs, with fried potatoes, <laughs> it was heaven. How many are hungry? <laughs> oh, I can still smell that fish. Oh. Peter, I don't think, though, had much of an appetite that day. You see, if you look closely, the fish and bread served by Christ recalls a feeding miracle of the 5,000. Jesus revealing himself by evoking memories of past miracles. And you have to love the sacramental nature of the whole scene. See, Jesus was accustomed to the, to the appetite one would have after a long night's work. And so he offered them bread and fish. But in the offer, Jesus also knew of a deeper hunger that each of the disciples possessed. A hunger for truth hunger for the love of God, hunger to, to know this truly was Jesus, risen and standing before them. So, just as he had offered himself to them every day of his earthly ministry, just as he had offered himself to them on the cross, and just as he had offered himself to them in the broken bread of that final Passover meal, Jesus once again offers them himself the bread of life. He also offered them fish. Is it any wonder that the fish symbol came to be a symbol of Christianity? Apart from all the Greek uh, acrostics, ictus, there was the fish. From the loaves and fishes, which fed 5,000 and 4,000. These are the two miraculous catches. The fish Jesus ate after the resurrection to prove that he wasn't just an apparition or a ghost, as we mentioned before last week. He didn't this just once, he did it twice. There was also the fact that so many of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. Fishing is being an appropriate accompaniment for warm bread that morning. The Lord was caring for the physical needs and even serving them, as he had so often before the resurrection or before the crucifixion. And there once again, a community gathered by and joined together by the living Christ. Then after he serves them breakfast, he takes Simon Peter off to the side, and three times he asks the same question. Simon, do you love me? Oh yes, Lord, Simon answers. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. As the risen Lord says, well, feed my sheep. The redemption of Peter is, is a subject here. Despite Simon Peter's obvious first follower role, throughout the gospel he has yet to live down the threefold denial of Jesus the night of the Master's arrest. It is then with mathematical precision that Jesus presses the point of Peter's loyalty and his love. Three times asking Simon Peter of John, do you love me? Brett 
Blair tells story of three little boys arguing about whose mom loved them more. First boy said, my mom loves me more because I gave her a quarter. And she gave it back to me and told me to go buy a piece of candy. Second little boy said, well, my mom loved me more because I gave her a quarter and she gave me two quarters back and told me to go buy two pieces of candy. Third little boy saw this was developing, thought for a moment, and he said, My mom loves me the most because I gave her a quarter, and she kept it, and told me how much my quarter is going to help pay the bills. Love requires a commitment. Jesus required it of Peter. He requires it of us today. First two times, Peter responds openly and eagerly, welcoming the opportunity to express his love and devotion. But by the third time, however, it had become apparent to Peter exactly what Jesus was doing. <clears throat> and it caused him to be hurt by his own conscience, by his own memory of his previous threshold failure to assert his relationship to Jesus, his Lord. In a sense, Peter would have been claiming that his love for Jesus was greater than the rest of the disciples. That he was better than the rest of them. But he did desert Jesus. Not only did he desert Jesus, he denied even knowing him. Not once, but three times. And that cock crowed. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these men love me? Humble, all Peter could say was, Lord, you know I love you. As if to say, Lord, I can't tell anything more than that. Not after what I did, but I do love you. You know, Babe Ruth, since we're in a baseball season here, Babe Ruth had hit 714 home runs during his baseball career. And he was playing one night, which was his last full major league game. It was the Braves versus the Cincinnati Reds. Another red story here. But the great Ruth was no longer as agile as he had once been. He fumbled the ball and threw it badly in, in, in more than one inning. His errors were responsible, in fact, for probably the five, five runs scored by Cincinnati. And as the babe walked off the field after the third out and headed for the dugout, crescendo of yelling and booing reached his ears. And just then, a, a boy jumped over the rail onto the field and ran up and grabbed him around the legs. With tears streaming down the little boy's face, he threw his arms around Babe's legs. And at that point in time, Ruth didn't hesitate. He picked that boy up in his arms, he hugged him, and he put him down on his feet and patted him on the head. You know what? The noise from the stand came to an abrupt halt. Suddenly there were no more booing, no more yelling. In fact, a hush filled the entire park. In those brief moments, the fans saw two heroes. Ruth, who, in spite of a dismal day on the field, could still care about a little boy. And a small lad who cared about the feelings of another human being. Both had melted the hearts of the entire crowd. I suspect that Ruth did, did feel defeated at that moment. But it was a tender and moving act for him to pick up that boy. And I suppose that is what Jesus is trying to get across to Peter. Life can deal us some, some pretty difficult blows at times. And you all know it can. You've all been there. many of which we may inflict upon ourselves. But if we love Christ, we're going to find a way in which to shake it off and help those around us. And maybe, just maybe, people will notice for once and for all and stop their booing and their hearts will be changed. As you heard the scripture read, Peter confesses, you know everything. Jesus knows his denials and desertions. He knows his yearnings to confess his love. 
With each assertion of his love, Jesus empowers Peter with a distinctive ongoing mission to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. And despite his failure of faith and nerve on the night of Jesus' arrest, Peter's commitment to Christ is itself resurrected and reaffirmed in that walk on the beach that morning. Some years ago, the London Daily Telegraph carried a letter written by an 11-year-old boy to his mother while he was on vacation in Switzerland. He wrote this. Dear Mom, yesterday the instructor took eight of us to the slopes to teach us to ski. I was not very good at it, so I broke a leg. Thank goodness it wasn't mine. <laughs> Love, Billy. <laughs> Now that mother had only a limited insight into what actually happened on that ski slope of Switzerland that day. And you and I have only a limited insight into what happened on that shore on the Sea of Galilee that day. But one thing we know, Jesus asked Simon Peter, do you love me three times? Why did he badger himself? Was it because Peter had denied the Lord three times and wanted to give him an opportunity three times to affirm his love and thus wipe the slate clean? The question and the answer period between Jesus and Peter accomplishes two things. And few argue that it's not an intentional salvaging of Peter's besmirched record on that night of Jesus' arrest. Just as Peter denied any knowledge of Jesus three times that hideous night, he is now allowed to announce his love for Christ that same number of times. Each of Peter's previous failures had been erased by his admissions of love. Peter is now called to identify himself with Jesus' image of the Good Shepherd. And like the Good Shepherd, Jesus declares on Peter's love is to be expressed in actions. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Jesus' command puts Simon Peter in a pastoral role, changing him to care and feed Jesus' flock, those of whom Jesus can say, I know my own, and my own know me. But Jesus stops short, reminding Simon Peter that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. But that's clearly the kind of love that's being required of that first follower. Jesus is being clear about Peter's role of caring for the young flock of new Christians, the lambs. Peter was to feed and nurture them through, their, through his leadership and faith. Peter was no longer simply the apprentice shepherd. Now the flock was his. Jesus was passing a man, just as Elijah had done to Elisha, feed them my lambs, be the good shepherd, just like I was. Be willing to lay down your life for the flock as I do. Three acts of denial. Three acts of redemption across a charcoal fire. With love and compassion filled with redemption and forgiveness, Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Here Jesus offers reconciliation, forgiveness, and redemption. And so doing, empowered Peter to be the leader he needed to be. What an awesome Savior we Robert Allen shared a story of how love does not compound guilt. Several years ago, he was in Washington, D.C., and he went on a tour of all the traditional the sites, you know, like the White House, the Smithsonian Institute, um, and then the Lincoln Memorial, and also the Hall of Congress. But he said there was something about standing in the Lincoln Memorial and reading the Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural address, which gives you goosebumps when you read it. And one line in, second on, in that second uh, Inaugural reminds us what a caring, compassionate man Lincoln was. He was speaking about the coming end of the war. He said, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Lincoln put this idea into practice on the day that the news arrived in Washington that the war was over. A crowd had gathered at the White House, military bands playing festive music, and Lincoln stood on the balcony. That White House, 
and he spoke. He said, lashing out at the South, he spoke of the horrors of being of the war being over. He spoke of families getting back together. He spoke of a time of peace. Then he said, in a few moments, I want the band to play, and I'm going to tell them what I want them to play. Of course, the band started getting together the, the theme song from, from, the, from the, the north side, you know, Battle of the Republic. They began getting it ready. This had to be the theme song he wanted to play. But Lincoln crossed him up. He stood there and he said, the band will now play the theme song of the people we have called our enemy. They are not our enemies anymore. We are one people again. I want the band to play Dixie. Historians said there was a very long, awkward pause. Because the band didn't have the music to Dixie. But they finally got it together and they played Dixie. Lincoln knew that the South was only hurting because of the horrors of war. But also because of the shame that accompanies defeat. Lincoln was sending a clear signal to the South. Lincoln was telling everyone there would be no punishment upon the South. Lincoln was saying that the South would be treated with love and compassion. <laughs> when you love, after the pattern of Jesus, caring and compassion, become the cornerstone of your love. Love is not vicious or hostile. Love does not try to compound the guilt. Love does not try to rub salt in the wound, so to speak. This morning, we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Put yourself in Peter's place. We've each smelled the charcoal smoke of our own denial. We each have those moments in our lives which only Jesus can redeem and forgive. Bring them to him today. Receive the bread that Jesus has to offer and experience for yourself the forgiveness he has to give. Breakfast is ready.